say, we're dotting around the solar system. And first up, we have Piero Dincheco, who is a planetary researcher at the German Space Center DLR. And he's going to be telling us about recently active lava flows on the eastern flank of Eden Mons on Venus. Um, next up, we have Nick Schneider. Um, of the laboratory for, astro, uh, for sorry laboratory for atmospheric space physics at the University of Colorado um, in uh, Boulder, who will be sharing unprecedented ultraviolet views of Mars from NASA's Maven mission. From there, we're going to turn to comets and Mattia Galeazzo from Western University in London, Ontario, is going to give us some insights into the birth of Rosetta's comet, where it originated and how long it's been active. And then finally, Jordan Steckloff from the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona, is going to tell us that avalanches, not internal pressure, cause comet nuclear, uh, nuclei outbursts. So, if... I can just reset and hand over to Piero. Yes. If you can choose a speaker. Yes, hello everyone. <clears throat> um, so, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Anita and uh, all the organizers of the DPS EPSC press conference for the invitation and uh, for giving me the possibility to be here to present the results of this work, which is, yes, okay, and then I would also like to, yes, I would like to thank the co-authors of this work, Niels Müller, Jörn Albert, and Mario de More from the German <clears throat> Aerospace Center for uh, having contributed, and uh, also the DLR press officers for having helped in uh, the press release. So, for uh, this presentation, we go to Venus. Venus is a, is a planet which has always been considered as a, uh, okay, as a Earth's twin sister, twin planet, because of uh, its uh, similar dimensions to Earth. But its cloud cover still hides a lot of secrets. Despite this, a lot of missions since the early 60s have been devoted to study the surface and atmosphere of Venus. As we can see on the image on the right side, uh, for example, the Venera landers have taken amazing pictures, photos from the surface of the planet. But also, I might mention the, the NASA Pioneer and, um, and uh, Magellan missions, and also more recently the Venus Express mission. So, our regional study area, it's called uh, IMDR Regio, and it's, uh, it's an area particularly uh, rich of uh, volcanic structures. It's located in the southwestern area, in the southwestern hemisphere of Venus, and uh, among those uh, volcanoes uh, which we can find in IM IMDR Regio, there is one which is the main actor of this presentation. This volcano is called Aydın Mons. Aydın Mons is a, is a volcanic structure of Venus which was first observed uh, with high resolution radar images by the Magellan spacecraft. It's a volcano which is uh, about 200 kilometers or 120 miles in diameter and uh, whose top stands about 2.5 or 1.6 miles above the surrounding plains. And the, particular, <clears throat> the particularity of uh, this volcano is that it was uh, uh, identified as an area with a relatively high emissivity by the Venus Express spacecraft. In particular, the Venus Express spacecraft identified uh, this red spot, what you can see on the, on the right image, which is uh, an anomaly indicating uh, oc um, recent occurrence of volcanism. So basically, according to uh, the data from the Venus Express, Aydın Mons would be a recently active volcano, or maybe currently active volcano. And uh, so we are very interested in the red spot, what, you can, what we can see there. And uh, starting from this uh, anomaly, we wanted to, to see, because unfortunately the Venus Express uh, spacecraft couldn't really observe so well through the clouds uh, due to the cloud cover, so we wanted to know what lava flows were 
possibly the source of this rat spot, what we can see. And uh, for this reason, we have used uh, high resolution radar images from the Magellan mission and uh, at the highest resolution. And uh, we have chosen an area to cover the red spot, so the top and the eastern flank of Iden Mons. And uh, over the top and eastern flank of Iden Mons, we mapped, we, we identified five lava flows. One top lava flow uh, and the four flank units. And after this, it comes the, the core of our study, which is the emissivity modeling. So once we mapped the lava flows, we have assigned a simulated value of emissivity to each mapped lava flow in order to, to observe how close was our configuration to the observation made by the Venus Express spacecraft. Basically, with the emissivity modeling, we wanted to see uh, what lava flows could be the real source of uh, this red spot observed by the Venus Express spacecraft. And uh, we have seen that the configuration which better approximates, reproduces the observation by Venus Express is the number seven, which is highlighted, and uh, where we assigned very high values of emissivity to the flank lava flows of Iden Mons. This basically means that according to our modeling, the flank lava flows are the ones responsible for this red spot. And um, this is particularly important because it is the first time we can map with such a high resolution lava flows from a volcanic structure which is believed to be recently or still active on a terrestrial body other than Earth. And uh, also we have to say that uh, it is very important to combine data sets. Uh, for example, in this case, we have combined the Magellan and the, the Venus Express data sets in order to get a more complete understanding of, uh, of the problem, um, what we are going to analyze. Also because new missions are coming, like for example, the ESA Envision and the NASA Discovery Veritas proposals, which are going to provide us important, uh, very high resolution data set, so we have to be ready in order to, to squeeze as much as possible the new data sets in the future with new techniques. So thanks a lot. Onwards to Mars. It's not quite looking like I expected. I know I can hit the reset button. So I'm uh, grateful for the chance to speak to you today, and I'm especially grateful to the large team that works with me on the MAVEN Imaging Ultraviolet Spectrograph. Many of you will know the MAVEN mission for its primary goal of studying the escape of Mars atmosphere and the climate history of the planet. And you might know some of the work of our imaging ultraviolet spectrograph, uh, for example, related to aurora on Mars and the meteor shower caused by comet siding spring. But today I'm here to talk to you about a remarkable set of images which have been enabled by an observing mode uh, called uh, uh, imaging spectroscopy, which I'll explain to you shortly. So our uh, spectrograph is mounted on the top of the boom that you see up here, and we can use two gimbals to orient the spacecraft towards Mars, and uh, our instrument contains a scan mirror so that we can uh, zigzag an image across the planet as we uh, uh, observe Mars, and at each location on the planet obtain a full ultraviolet spectrum back behind that pixel. And this allows us to make a number of uh, uh, new observations, the new capabilities to have insights into night glow on Mars, uh, ozone present in the atmosphere, and also the formation of clouds. This uh, technique of uh, imaging spectroscopy is different from standard imaging in which a series of filters would be placed uh, in front of the detector to separate colors very broadly, but we take a full spectrum. Recently, we've uh, taken advantage of the high data rate as Venus, uh, sorry, as Mars and Earth were very close together uh, and uh, obtained some of the highest resolution images that we've obtained, uh, uh, which has been very productive. Here's the first example 
uh, the first of the three results that I'll be talking about is night glow. This is a common planetary phenomenon in which an atmosphere will glow at night in the complete absence of illumination. And it's a result of chemical reactions in a planet's atmosphere. In the case of Mars, the uh, molecules are broken apart on the day side of the planet, which is uh, down here, uh, where we don't get any data. And those molecules uh, uh, are broken into atoms, and the atoms are carried by the winds, global circulation patterns to the night side and to uh, primarily the winter pole, where they then descend to higher density and recombine, and in that act of recombining, have enough energy to give off ultraviolet photons. So uh, we did not discover this phenomenon. Uh, Mars Express has had some uh, wonderful observations related to night glow. Uh, uh, but uh, we have new insights thanks to imaging spectroscopy. Uh, this uh, shows the methodology here. Uh, so behind every pixel on this map is a, an ultraviolet spectrum, and the brightness of this map shows the degree to which that spectrum agrees with this very uh, typical spectrum of nitric oxide. And so we're not um, uh, uh, contaminated by backgrounds or other emissions. We know this is nitric oxide. And uh, thanks to imaging spectroscopy, we're able to get the first map of this emission over over the night side. And uh, uh, there's several important things about obtaining images like this. First of all, we see the expected enhancement in radiation around the winter pole, and the, uh, where the atmosphere is descending and recombining more easily. But then the surprises come, and specifically, these brightenings, uh, these splotches and streaks here, are not what we expected from uh, global circulation modeling. And they indicate that those winds that flow around the planet um, and uh, undergo strong seasonal variations are more irregular than had been expected. And we're already underway with modeling and analysis to see what that's trying to tell us about the overall transport of these ingredients around the planet and especially um, the chemistry that then happens as a result. Next up is ozone, which is a rare gas on Mars. There's not much atmosphere and there's not much um, oxygen from which to make it. You will have seen maps like this for Earth's pole that will show a deficit in uh, ozone and ozone hole at the pole, but actually ozone accumulates on the Martian poles, we may call it an ozone pile. Uh, different chemistry occurs in the Martian atmosphere. And this phenomenon has uh, uh, been extensively studied by prior spacecraft uh, that you see listed here. Uh, but we are able to uh, come with a new perspective in large part from being able to see such a very wide angle from morning all the way through evening here around the polar region and get a good clear view of the pole and to do so periodically. Uh, so what we're seeing here in this polar projected image is, uh, first of all, we've scaled those ultraviolet colors up to um, visible wavelengths. Uh, and so this is what we would see with ultraviolet eyes. Uh, the dark areas are the surface. There's a cloud right there. And this um, uh, bright edge here is the edge of the carbon dioxide, uh, of the dry ice um, polar cap. And these small circular features that you can see are uh, craters being exposed uh, as the uh, southern polar cap recedes uh, because it's spring down there. Now, ozone absorbs in the mid-ultraviolet. It's a good thing here on Earth. It also happens uh, in Mars, and that means that this uh, middle color here, uh, green in this case, is absorbed, leaving the uh, blue and red that gives rise to the magenta color, which is your key that this is the presence of ozone. So again, the first order result that we have is this confirms the basic picture that uh, we've had for some time for ozone in the Mars atmosphere that accumulates in the polar regions. The primary reason it accumulates there is it's incredibly dry and uh, virtual absence of water vapor in the atmosphere because the breakdown of water vapor, uh, the constituents, uh, hydrogen and oxygen and their combinations, uh, can destroy ozone. And that's not happening inside this uh, polar vortex uh, which surrounds the ozone region here uh, as it does at Earth. 
And uh, you can see this uh, wavy structure here. This is a Rossby wave or a planetary wave that's actually traveling around the South Pole we see in multiple images. And uh, this information that we have about the nature of the polar vortex and especially how uh, long this ozone lasts through spring is an important uh, constraint on the evolution of uh, uh, ozone and water vapor, sort of a coupled chemistry in the Mars atmosphere. And of course, we're especially interested in what happens to uh, water on Mars because we watch the breakdown products of water escape from the top of the atmosphere, so we need to know what happens down at the bottom of the atmosphere. Last up uh, is uh, clouds on Mars. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, water ice clouds, a very common phenomenon in the Mars atmosphere and also studied uh, initially from the ground and then extensively by probably every Mars mission. Clouds are gonna be important because they allow us to trace atmospheric flows. They uh, obviously affect the energy balance based on whether light is absorbed or uh, reflected or if energy is released in cloud formation. Uh, and they also tell us about the inventory of water vapor that would be available for uh, forming clouds. So uh, how is it possible after all these other observations to have a new perspective? Well, our spacecraft, unlike the other spacecraft, orbits high above the uh, surface on part of our orbit, and so we can get a global view. The other spacecraft are so close to the surface, they get wonderful uh, high-resolution views, but not the global perspective. And our orbit carries us back to the same perspective every few hours, and so we get to see the uh, evolution with time. So there are a wonderful host of things to see in this image, and I've labeled them here. Uh, the main point I'll be talking about uh, are these um, clouds which have formed over the Tharsis volcanoes. Uh, there's the um, ozone we were talking about in the dust cap uh, previously. Anywhere there's atmosphere, uh, in the ultraviolet, there's a whole lot of scattering, of reflecting of the light back. And so all around the edge of the planet, you can see uh, a lot of uh, a brightness, uh, except for Olympus Mons, you see there, which is poking up through the atmosphere so we can see its dark surface. Similarly, Valles Marineris, which is the lowest altitude region on the planet, is so full of atmosphere atmosphere that its uh, surface is obscured uh, due to that same scattering. So to get you oriented for the movie I'm about to show you, this is going to be the morning side of the planet here. Everything will rise here, travel across midday, and go to the, uh, go to the afternoon here. Um, and so we've taken several um, uh, IEVS images and rotated them and interpolated them so you can see this progression in clouds. And uh, I'll put my cursor where uh, one of the Tharsis volcanoes um, uh, rises in the morning. You'll see it come around again uh, shortly. Oops, my cursor has gone away. Uh, and uh, at any rate, just pick your favorite volcano and uh, watch the, uh, the growth of the clouds over the course of the animation here. Uh, even Olympus Mons is doing it. And uh, so to put it in, uh, uh, in a still form, you can see here this incredible expansion of the clouds over the course of just seven hours. Uh, they basically merge together here in a cloud um, uh, bank that must be a thousand miles across. Uh, and uh, what's really important about the existence of this data, this is just the kind of information you want to be plugging into your um, circulation model for cloud formation to see just how well uh, you've got the physics down. So uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, uh, even after many, image, uh, many spacecraft missions to Mars, uh, there's a new way of looking at the planet thanks to these uh, images created through uh, spectroscopic imaging. Uh, and if we take all these three themes of night glow, ozone, and clouds, they're all related to circulation, they're all related to chemistry, and they're going to really advance our understanding in those areas. And with MAVEN just extended for two years, we anticipate studying all these phenomena uh, through uh, the full range of Mars seasons. Uh, next up is uh, Mattia Galeazzo. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes. I don't know how to find my...
Okay, it's working. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to come to listen to me and the other colleagues. Um, Comet uh, uh, 67P was discovered by Churyumov in uh, 1969 on, of, on a photographic plate done by her colleague uh, Svetlana Grazimenko in the former USSR. Uh, this comet is, uh, under, uh, was under a space mission called Rosetta, and uh, bo uh, together with uh, Phile, uh, uh, a little robot uh, launched from Rosetta, they both landed on the, on the comet. The primary um, goal of this um, mission was to study the physical activity and, and also the origin of this comet. The main orbital physical parameters of the comet 67P are that uh, this uh, comet is a member of the Jupiter family comet. The Jupiter family comets are called like this because uh, the orbit is uh, uh, controlled by, by the orbit of Jupiter. In fact, you can see in the plot, in a uh, light uh, blue, the orbit of the comet, and in violet, the orbit of, uh, of Jupiter, and you see that they intersect. But uh, the orbit of the comet intersects also, also the orbit of Mars, that is in red. This comet has a bell orbit shape, and uh, is, uh, this uh, shape uh, is uh, quite controversial. People, uh, the scientists think that uh, it, it is due to a binary collision or to or the fission of a couple of uh, binary asteroids. And uh, based, based on uh, um, physical studies, its origin is still controversial. Uh, we still don't know if uh, this comet comes from a solar nebula or it's, uh, uh, it, it, it is uh, it went originated in the transneptunian object form, uh, formation, or even it is younger. So this is still a question. Our work aimed to find the, the possible, uh, more probable or, or, uh, orbit, and uh, it, it can give some hints on its origin. And to do this, we simulate uh, several uh, orbits. In particular, we, we generate some clones of, uh, of, a, of the orbit of a, of a comet. Clones are, uh, are a little bit shifted orbits of this uh, comet. And today I show to you uh, the evolution from the, present, from the present to the past. And we, we consider the, the orbit of this comet uh, till 200 million years ago. The, the work is still in progress and now we are, work, we are, work, we are working to, to study the, um, the orbit from the past to the present. Um, selecting uh, the most probable orbits, uh, the most probable origin that we think the comet comes from. In particular, we think that comes from the Cooper Belt, also because um, past studies suggest that all, uh, fa um, Jupiter family comets come from the Cooper Belt. But also, we take a region from the result of our, our study in point A. And we consider the evolution of the orbit only till 120 astronomical units because uh, after 120 astronomical units, that is the fourth time the distance of Neptune to the Sun, we still don't know very well uh, how many objects and how they are the objects uh, distributed in, in, in the farther solar system. Um, speaking about results, we found that uh, the comet uh, has a, a large uh, change in its orbit in 1959, because it has uh, an important cross encounter with Jupiter. This uh, result is, is in agreement with past work uh, that I um, show, show here. And we found, we compute that uh, the comet is uh, in the inner solar system at least uh, since uh, 3,000 years, but not more than 11,000 years. And the most of the probable lifetime of the comet inside 120 astronomical units, that again is for time the distance from Neptune to, to the Sun, is about 160,000 years. Uh, the, most perturbing uh, the most perturbing planet on, on the orbit evolution of, of a comet is Jupiter, especially in the present. And, but a uh, minor role is played also by Mars, um, Ceres, and Vesta. Just to simplify the situation to explain you better, it's like that uh, the comet, uh, you can think that it's like the car is uh, uh, overtaking a bus, and the bus is Jupiter. And uh, it's more difficult to overtake a bus. And for the planet like uh, Mars, it's like to overtake a bike. So you have less perturbation by Mars. Uh, in the past, uh, before uh, it was a Jupiter family comet, uh, this comet has a lot of encounters with Uranus and, and uh, Neptune concerning our results. 
Here is a video of, uh, of this, present, um, this present orbit. You see that the comet is crossing the orbit of Jupiter. And then next we show the evolution of the past, the most probable orbit. 60,000 years ago, the comet was orbiting between Saturn and uh, Neptune in an uh, orbit called uh, like, uh, the Centaur region. And uh, 400,000 years ago, the comet was even beyond after Uranus till Neptune, till Pluto, sorry. And later on, million years ago, the comet was in the scattering disk, a region after Neptune, till uh, more than 100 astronomical units, about three times uh, the distance of Neptune to the sun. And now you can see that the orbit is pretty inclined, was pretty inclined in the past uh, in, in respect to the orbit of the planets. So uh, the orbit of the, of the planets, we can see that is uh, called the ecliptic plane, so the orbit uh, of the comet is very inc uh, quite inclined to, uh, to the orbit of the ecliptic plane. And the orbit is very eccentric. You mean that, uh, it means that uh, it's not circular, but very uh, like a, um, a long ellipse. Consequences of this work is that uh, the, the, the current orbit of a comet is uh, very recent. And uh, we can speculate about the activity of a comet also by num numerical uh, computation of the orbits, because we found that uh, this comet is here not less than 3,000 years and not more than 11 years. So the comet was active in inside this range of time, 3,000 years and 11 years, 11,000 years. Very likely, this comet resided uh, for a long time in the scattering disk. As you can see in the plot, is the region after Neptune till uh, more or less 120 astronomical units. But in particular, we found that uh, for a million years, it, it can stay for, uh, in a region between uh, 62, 65 astronomical units, that is about two times the distance of Neptune to the sun. And uh, we cannot exclude, however, that the comet um, stayed in, in larger orbit, uh, more than 120 astronomical units, uh, due to different uh, dynamical situation meaning that we don't know what, what, if there are large objects after 120 astronomical units that could be interacting with the orbit of this comet. Therefore, we need more investigation of the outer solar system to, to see the next step after this work in case. And uh, I mean that we need, uh, for sure, more space telescopes. So we, uh, I open all science hopes that we, we have more funding to, to launch space, space telescopes in these regions after Neptune, and even between Jupiter and, and Neptune, because we still don't know the distribution of these uh, objects here. We, we have to know the, the size distribution, their orbits, and uh, their physical, physical uh, properties. And um, another thing important that these comets can cross uh, the terrestrial planet's orbit, so the, the orbits of Mars and even the Earth. And uh, because uh, they do to their activity, they transport uh, uh, material that is meaningful to life, like water or uh, amino acids, something like this. Um, they, they can also, uh, they can, they, they are these comets are important also because they can give life, but they can also destroy life because uh, they can intercept the orbit of planets and they also can also collide. So it's, so, it's so it's very important to, uh, to constrain more very, very typical orbits. In, in this way, um, we can, we can um, understand if the comet was uh, very important in the evolution of, of planets like Mars and Earth. And maybe 67P would be uh, um, in a more closer um, orbit in the future. Thank you for your attention. Let the word to feed. Okay, um, this talk has the title A Creaking and Cracking Comet, which is a slightly flashy title. Uh, so the first thing I will try to do is to convince you that the comet Juromovigeras-Amingo is indeed creaking and cracking. 
Uh, then I will touch a little bit on what you can learn from the fact that it is creeping and cracking, and then I will end up with a few consequences of the whole thing. Um, what you see here is a image taken by the UCS camera system looking into the neck region of the comet. You know the shape of this comet CG is this rubber duck shape with the head and the tip and the body, and we are looking basically into the neck, between the body and the, and, and the neck. And uh, one of the dominant features you really see on the comet is that we have, in this case here, a very clear big crack in the surface of the comet. Uh, what you see on the right-hand side here is two images, one taken in year 2014 and the other one taken in year 2016. So one is before the perihelion passage of the comet as the closest approach to the sun, and one is after one. And one thing you pretty clearly see is that this big crack feature is actually changing quite significantly. We, the crack has extended down here by several hundreds of meters on the surface. Another thing that is popping up that is, looks like we might actually be creating a new crack in the surface. So, so in the neck region of the comet, we are definitely seeing changes in the, in the surface that are really large-scale cracks. Uh, another feature we see on the surface is this thing here. What you're looking at is images looking down on the bottom or the foot of the comet in what's called the Emotep region. Uh, the Emotep region is, we call it a gravitational low. If you, look, if you calculate the gravitational field of the comet, this is a place where, where things will things flying around and um, which are mobile on the surface of the comet will tend to end up because this is, it's like the water on the Earth is found on the, in the oceans because the bottom of the ocean is very low. It's not found on top of Mount Everest. So things have a tendency to go to the lowest point in the gravitational field. Uh, and this area is full of backfall material on the comet. And what you're looking at are some really big scale features that we have detected during the perihelion passage of the comet. And what you see is these strange ring type features which are actually expanding around. And these features look an awful lot like rings in the pond. If you throw a rock into water, you see something spreading out. Uh, and one, this is not a completely unique interpretation, but it's uh, tempting one is that this is happening because you actually see a crack happening beneath ground that somehow shifts the surface and this creates a wave pattern basically because you shift the waters like a tsunami that we see in the ocean and then you see things spreading out of it and then it stabilizes again after a while. And this is a process called liquefaction, so dry liquefaction, which can happen in, in materials when you have a little bit of gas around and you and you move them around. Uh, this is one of the really nice pictures we have from the comet. This is a view basically taken at a very steep angle where you're looking down on, on the surface of the comet at a, and uh, what you're seeing as this is actually this area that you saw in very lower resolution before. So this is the surface of the pond and this would be the coastline, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, when you look at the resolution of these images, what you're looking at is actually not dust. It's actually more like, I uh, pull this image off the internet, it's, it's, it's physically it's probably more like, like a, a ball pond like children are playing in, meaning that this is not dust particle, it's bigger, like 10, 15, 20 centimeter boulders, at least on the top. There may be dust lower down. Okay, so I hope I have convinced you that we do indeed have things like creaking and cracking happening on the comet. Now what can we learn about a comet from the fact that we, this happens? Uh, well, you can do some modeling work. Um, and what we have done is something called an FEM model, it stands for finite element model, and uh, this is a very fancy name for something actually relatively simple. Uh, what you do in a model like that is that you take we have a 3D shape of the comet, which is a surface shape. Uh, then you can fill that three surface shape out with uh, grid structure internally, and each node of that grid, uh, you can then calculate what is the gravitational field pulling in that part of the comet from the self-gravity of the comet. 
uh, and then you have the interaction between that point and all other surrounding points. Uh, it's something called a linear elastic model. Uh, so basically you have gravity and every point in the comet is connected with a spring, <laughs> is, in, is the analogy you do. Secondly, we have rotating comets, so the whole thing is spinning around. When you have something spinning around, you have a centrifugal force that is trying to shift things away from the rotation axis. And then finally, we have one thing addition in the comet, uh, and that is we have built in a, an activity model. Uh, uh, the comet is active, meaning that the sunlit surface of the comet is blowing gas and dust out. And uh, this is a little bit like adding a small rocket and it's each facet on the surface, so this will apply a force on the surface of the comet. Uh, this is a time-dependent force because the comet is rotating. So I'll try to illustrate that down here. So when the sun is coming from, from this direction, you are, sun sign, you are illuminating this part of the comet, and that means you have a, f a jet engine basically blowing in this direction, and when the comet rotates around six hours later, it's the exact opposite, meaning that it's this side of the surface that is active, and that means the, the comet is sort of rocking a little bit on a 12-hour basis. Okay, when you then try to illustrate the result of a model like this, this is what you're looking at is two images. This is the neck region, and this is the the Imhotep region, the foot of the comet again. And what you see here is a property called the Van Mises stress. It's a fancy word for, for trying to put, put the full information about the stresses in the, in the comet into one number, which is a scalar property which you can actually illustrate in a, on a view graph like this. And what you see is a couple of things. In the neck region, you see this very band here. This is a band of the comet which is under what's called compressive strength. The, the, the comet and the, the head of the comet and the bottom of it's sort of trying to collapse together because uh, the center of mass is actually located somewhere down here, very close to the surface. So the comet is gravitationally instable. It's only the material properties of the comet that's keeping the whole thing from collapsing into a, into a ball. So this region here happens because the head of the body is basically trying to roll onto the center of mass. But because it's trying to roll onto the center of mass, there's a region down here where the sign of the stress changes. It goes from being compressive to being pulled. It's like a ball. It's, it, when you're pushing one direction, you're pulling in the other side. And this happens to be exactly the region where we saw the big crack in the images. When you look at the foot of the comet, this is the region where we saw these big wave phenomena. Uh, in, in some sense, the foot of the, the comet of the foot of the comet is like hamming a big beam and putting it over edge of a cliff, and uh, what's sticking out of the cliff is trying to fall down. And at the point where you have this intersection between the support and, and the unsupported part, you put a lot of stress on the body. This is something building engineers on the Earth when they build a house have to deal with a lot. Uh, and this happens to be. In this region, this band sticking across here where you see all these dark, oops, dark green and, and, and greenish colors. Okay, what can we learn from this? Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, because the comet has cracked, we learned something important about comets. We, it, we, we learned that the stresses we have on the comet are bigger than the material strength of the comet. And this tells us that we have an upper limit on the material strength, what's called the tensile strength of the comet, which is smaller than the number you see here. And that means we have put an upper limit on the tensile strength of the cometary material at a very low number. And because down here you, you see, I, I wrote here 60 to 200 pascal. Uh, just to give you an impression of what that means, uh, uh, steel would be in the many, many gigapascals range. So this is nothing. This is almost, this is the tensile strength of fluffy snow or something like that. So a com comets are indeed 
extremely weak. It is basically just an accumulation of very, very fluffy material that is only hanging very loosely together. Um, another point is we can play around with the rotation speed we have put into the comet model, into the stress model. And uh, because one thing that happens with this comet is that each pair heel passage, the, it looks like the rotation period changes by about 20 minutes. Oh, I see, I have to run. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and one important thing is that the stress variations you get from that is ballpark the material strengths. That means that inside a rotation period, you can actually do things with this comet. OK, let me continue. Uh, well, some consequences. One consequence is, uh, and this, by the way, explains these are all the other comets we have visited with spacecraft in recent years. And uh, if you look at these, CG looks a little bit different than the others. Because generally, you, the ones that has this bilobal structure uh, tends to be cigar-shaped, where CG is not. But there's a very good chance that uh, CG within two, three hundred years maybe will change shape. The head will probably, because of the spin-up, roll down and create this cigar shape you see in the other one. So the comet shape we have now is not a very stable thing. Uh, another thing you can, and this, when you have this kind of cracking going on, is, uh, is that we have a potential explanation mechanism for, for uh, one of these mysterious things we have in Comet. We have these outbursts happening in Comet, Comets. And one thing that potentially could happen is that you have a crack opening in the ground. The crack opening in the ground all of a sudden allows deeper down material free access to space. And if you crack down into a hypervolatile rich region, so you have CO or CO2, CO2, that all of a sudden can adiabatically expand into space, and then all of a sudden you get a burp. And this will basically blow material on for a short time until you run out of gas in the near surface, and then the whole thing will die down. And uh, one of the nice, this is actually one of these outbursts we by coincidence happen to catch looking straight on. And this, in this case, you can see this is a case where these outbursts actually come from a region where you exactly have this stress, high stress properties. And I think I'm just going to skip this slide because I'm out of time. <laughs> The next speaker is Jordan Stickloff. Hit the reset button. The reset button. Hey, that was easy. It's actually just a button that says reset. That's, uh, I haven't seen that since Nintendo. Uh, yeah, so that should be the right one, right? Does this work? And it's loading. So I guess this means I'm the closer. So. So my talk is going to be, I actually gave me a nice segue into, uh, into comet outbursts, so I appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm Jordan Stackloff. I'm currently at Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. And I'll be talking about some recent work that's suggesting that perhaps these outbursts that look a lot like geysers uh, are perhaps have a different cause. So actually, let me just show you a good, a good photo of an outburst. Uh, and I apologize, this, uh, this should be captioned to uh, Isa and, their, uh, and the Osiris team. Uh, they captured these dramatic geyser-like features coming off of this nucleus. And it's been long thought that, well, they look like geysers, maybe they're geysers. We, maybe we have a heat source in the interior of the comet that's causing this gas to sublimate, building up pressure, and then poof, we have a nice explosion, and out comes this nice collimated plume. Uh, there's a problem with that. Uh, geysers on the Earth are heated with warm uh, magma. You think of Yellowstone, it's on top of this uh, hot spot. There's, uh, there's a lot of heat inside of the interior of the Earth. But when we're looking at a comet, these are, these are features that are heated by the sun. So they're, it's, it's a completely different process where they're heated from top down, not from bottom up. And so this doesn't seem to be a very good analogy for what is happening on these bodies. But we do have some other uh, things that might be happening on the nucleus. And one of these is that we're seeing a lot of what's known as mass wasting or avalanches, if you will. And I really wanted to show some videos of people out skiing avalanches, but it didn't seem to be too terribly related to what I'm doing. But the central idea is that we see on Comet 67P Churyumov-Gerasimenko, on the left, we see these cliffs. 
where there's material that seems to be falling off the cliffs and collecting at the bottom. And this is ice-rich material, which means that it's going to be producing a lot. It's going to it's going to get heated by the sun and go right into the gas phase. And so it effectively produces this weak breeze coming off the nucleus when it's heated. Now on the right, what we see is something on top of these cliffs are effectively avalanches. We're seeing smooth terrains, and this was observed by Rosetta. On the left, you see that it's just a nice, pristine surface. And on the right, it was imaged a few months later, and suddenly there's material missing. There's clearly been a slide of material down the cliff. So what does this look like? Well, if we were to cut it in half, what we could see, or a cross-section, if you will, what we would see is that if the material gets steep enough, typically around 30 to 45 degrees or above, then the surface layer becomes unstable. And what this means is that the surface layer is going to flow downhill, and this is effectively what happens when you have an avalanche. You leave the underlying material stable, and the, um, and the top layers actually slide down. And, um, uh, this is actually a video I pulled off of YouTube, but uh, I can get you the citation if you want to do anything with it. Um, all right, so with that said, uh, I applied this exact same model, or uh, I, I, I developed a two-layer model for common avalanches. And the idea is that, well, let's combine these two things. Let's combine outgassing at the bottom of a cliff with a dusty layer that slides into it at the top of the cliff. And so if you look at this structure, we have a dusty layer on top. This acts like a blanket and insulates the ice below it. And then you have this outcrop of, of dusty and ice-rich material on the bottom. And so if you were to shine the sun on that, suddenly we're going to get a little bit of activity. The ice is going to heat up. We're going to get a plume. But this is not the end of the story. We've known that this happens, and we've seen this happening for a while. What's interesting is what happens when you allow a slab of granular material to slide into that. And what happens is you end up with a couple of different things. You end up with, you still have this primary plume which is coming directly from outgassing of the surface. But what's different is that suddenly you have this very short-lived, highly collimated transient plume that uh, is due to avalanche material. It lives for a, a few minutes to a few tens of minutes, which is the length of an avalanche in a low gravity environment like Comet 67P, Cherimov, Gerasimenko. And as it reaches the edge of this outgassing region, it's, it gets blown in the same direction. It's like throwing flour into a fan. So the question is, do we see this process happening anywhere on a comet? Well, the, uh, this also should be credited to Esa Osiris. And, uh, what they observed is that, well, let's take a look at this comet over time. And what they saw is that right there was a very short-lived plume that was about 10 minutes or less in duration. And it was very tightly collimated. And if we rotate that and compare it to what we would expect from an avalanche, what we see is that they look very similar to one another. And this suggests that this process is probably very likely responsible for causing these transient plumes on comets that we see as outbursts. So, to conclude, it looks like avalanches can cause these highly collimated plumes consistent with outbursts, and that the observed outbursts on 67P, uh, Trimov, Gary Semenko, are morphologically similar to what we would expect. So, thank you. Many thanks to all our speakers. We are running a little bit late, but we will do our best with questions. Um, is there anybody here that has questions? We will be taking them online as well. Uh, Leslie. Yes. Leslie Sage, Nature. So when I was in grad school 30 years ago, it was believed that Venus did not have plate tectonics. Do, um, does your observation of an active volcano imply that there is plate tectonics on Venus? It should be on. Okay. <clears throat> no, actually, uh, volcanism on Venus is mainly related uh, to hot spots. So, also, Eidenmonts, it's a hot spot like volcano. So, it's more typical of the volcanoes what we find uh, on Earth, but uh, within the continents. So it, it is not connected with plate tectonics. So the type of volcanism on Venus is, is, um, is comparable with volcanism on Earth, but with a certain type of volcanism on Earth, which is not related with plate tectonics. Uh, Emily, can you identify yourself? Um, Emily Lakdawalla with the Planetary Society. I have questions for Stuba and Jordan on the uh, mechanisms. So, uh, Stuba, can you talk about that propagating wave 
uh, that you saw in Imhotep, what's the mechanism and uh, how long does it take or how quickly is the wave propagating? And then for Jordan, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the how the mechanism of the avalanche creates a collimated uh, jet from, from the comet. Well, the wave was uh, slow in the, in the sense that it's uh, it's not like a water expansion. I think it was something like 30 centimeters per hour, if I remember correctly, that we saw expansion. Uh, but this is still clearly not a sublimation-driven event. Also, it's not the it's not the surface that is eroding away at that speed. It's orders of magnitude high, faster than would be case. So it 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 would be compatible with a high viscous fluid type scenario. Yeah, is this working all right? Um, and I guess I should wait for Emily to stop typing. <laughs> uh, no worries? All right. And so the idea is that um, the question is how do you get a highly, how do you make it, how do you get collimated if you're just blowing a bunch of material into a weak breeze? And I mean, uh, the analogy would be just taking a bag of flour and just chucking it into a fan, you would expect a big cloud of, of dust and everyone gets covered in all dusty. Uh, but what's different about this process on a comet is that we have to remember these are incredibly low gravity environments. And so when we're looking at the speeds of materials sliding downhill, we're talking about a fraction of a mile an hour. Um, a turtle could outrun one of these things. Uh, and so what's happening is that you're injecting this material into, it's, it's sliding downhill where it's protected from outgassing, from, from this breeze. And as it enters the region that is outgassing, it's all entering that region at the exact same spot. And because it's entering at the same spot, it all gets blown in the same direction. And so we're slowly injecting material uh, a fair amount at a time, but it's slowly moving in. And so because it's moving at a uniform velocity, at a uniform speed, uh, it ends up being blown in the exact same direction. And that's how we end up getting a natural process of collimation. <laughs> Thanks. I think we have a number of questions from our remote uh, viewers. Rick? Yes, we'll get started with a couple questions from Sky and Telescope magazine for Nick. Uh, first one from Kelly Beattie. Uh, the orographic cloud growth seems especially dramatic. Should it be visible to amateurs, in, well, to ground-based telescopes at all, and, and potentially to amateurs? Uh, so uh, Kelly is referring um, to orographic clouds, clouds that naturally form over mountains, and we've, uh, certainly we see this happen on Earth. It's a very common process. Uh, and even the formation of uh, clouds in the afternoon is a very common phenomenon as the, uh, all the convection elevates material to uh, colder regions. So I refer to um, uh, ground-based observations. Uh, it's a little before my time. Um, but I refer to the, the name Nix Olympa, Olympus, anybody know that name? Um, so I believe that ground-based observers uh, have been able to see uh, clouds above Olympus Mons. And now I look to the audience, actually. Can anybody uh, confirm this? I certainly would expect this kind of phenomenon to be observable, and I would not be surprised. So I'm, I'm seeing a, a nod from somebody who would know. OK, and then the second question. Um which I think you just kind of alluded to the answer, but can you explain um, why it is exactly that these clouds form uh, in the daytime? Uh, so it is the process of uh, convection. Uh, the warming of the surface in the daytime will uh, cause atmospheric gases to rise. You know, I live in Colorado where this happens all the time and, and the atmosphere carries the water vapor up to lower temperatures uh, where you're basically more than 100% relative humidity and clouds will form. Uh, so I don't have any special knowledge about uh, anything that might be different about Mars. That's just regular um, uh, uh, cloud formation physics. Uh, Kelly was asking, uh, is it surprising that it's this fast? And uh, the truth is, uh, we don't have a lot of observations to compare this to. So I don't, uh, and, and I'm also not aware of uh, global circulation models that would really provi provide guidance, but we're hoping that will come in the near future. I think we have time for a couple more questions from people in the room. Um, does anybody want to ask something? Can you just wait for the microphone and then identify yourself and your affiliation? Great. Um, Alex with you with Nature. Also for Nick, um, what can you learn from IAVS about dust storms and especially whether we're going to be getting a global dust storm anytime soon? Uh, this is a, a capability that I only uh, showed very briefly that um, we're able to see dust in the atmosphere 
um, uh, in the most recent dust season. This was a bit of a surprise to us, but um, in the same way that Olympus Mons was sticking up through the, the scattering atmosphere, the dust is high enough up that it looks very dark to us. So uh, we're not the best instrument for studying dust storms. There are other um, instruments on other spacecraft that are doing that. But I think we're going to learn something about the dust that reaches the highest altitudes from our observations. It's a new data set to us, and we're still in the early stages as far as the dust storm goes. But we're eager to, to work with those other teams that are also studying the dust storms. Rick, do you have any further questions from our remote viewers? Yeah, we do have a few. Um, this one's from, uh, it's a set of three questions for Piero from Camille Carlisle, also of Sky and Telescope, um, concerning Venus. She asks, how do you identify the five lava flows in the Magellan data? What is it that makes them stand out? So we, had, we identified the lava flows, sorry, uh, by using high resolution uh, radar images from the Magellan dataset, basing on uh, three main parameters. We were analyzing uh, the surface brightness variation in the radar images and also the slope and, uh, and the visible fractures which might tell us also the source of each lava flow. And then she asked, how large is the lava flow that you suspect created the red spot that showed up in the Venus Express image? Okay, it's about uh, 20 kilometers, even a bit, a bit more, yes. And then finally, what do you need, what kind of data do you need or observations in order to confirm that it's active volcanism, rule out other possibilities? So, uh, you mean, uh, I'm not sure if I got the question. Uh, what well, she's data? asking, how, how can you confirm that what you suspect is active volcanism really is that? Okay, we need, of course, uh, other data from, from uh, future missions, but we have already like very important clues from uh, the data what we got from the Venus Express. So, I mean, we see that the, that location is, uh, uh, is active. So we see that Aydan Mons is an active or recently active volcano. Uh, of course, we need uh, better data to identify the source, but already what we, we did, it's, uh, it's a very good start. And uh, yes, now we look at the future. Right, um, we are at the end of our nominal time for our briefing, so thank you very much to all our speakers, uh, to Piero Tinceco, to Nick Schneider, Marie, uh, Mattia Galeato, um, Stube Fid, I'm sorry, I missed you out in the introduction, um, and uh, Jordan Steckloff. Um, our next briefing is tomorrow. It will be at the earlier time of 12.15 local time here in California, which is 19.45 UTC. Tomorrow's briefing will be all about Pluto and New Horizons, so do please join us then. Can I also say that we have a number of USRA scientists who will be available to talk to the media. They're going to be in the, the, the room 205 tomorrow. Um, tomorrow afternoon and on Wednesday morning. If you want to see who they are, there's a list up in the press office, which is room 208. We do encourage, they've got, uh, do encourage you to come and talk to them. There's many fascinating things that they will have to tell you. So that's all for today, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks.